Hey guys, and welcome back to Tennis 360, the podcast where we talk about all things tennis. My name is Anthony Hirsch. I'm Eliza Westgate. Welcome back to Tennis 360 podcast. So we have the start of the grass court swing. We went from the clay to the grass, and uh, we've had tournaments in Stuttgart. We've had tournaments in Nottingham. We've had tournaments in Sahar Tagenbosch, where uh, starting from uh, in uh, the tournament in, uh, I'm sure I'm butchering it, but uh, Sahar Tagenbosch, where Alex Diemenor defeated Sebastian Korda, 6-2, 6-4. He gets a career high of world number seven. For anybody who's not paying attention, Diemenor is climbing up the ranks. Uh, great tournament for him. Sebastian Corda himself, uh, now a final on all the surfaces, indoor hard, grass, clay, outdoor hard. But um, yeah, new career high for Alex, which is a great play from him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what a season he's having. I think um, he's he's always loved the grass season. My my personal funny anecdote is I remember very vividly being a ball girl for him when he was playing the junior tournaments and um, seeing that he had the variety to, to do well on this surface and just seems yeah. to really love it there. Um, and I thought he, he has made some, you know, some additions to his game throughout this season, predominantly in the serve. And I think that was kind of Really, what we were able to see this week is the serves, serve speeds were really up. He was only out served or outpaced on average on the serve by Milos Raonic, who would expect to hit bigger serves than him. But he was having faster average serves than quarter in the final and all of his other opponents. And I think that that is testament to you know a lot of the work that he's put in over the past 18 months and reason why he's now so far inside the top 10. And I also think uh, what was really effective for him in this match was just the depth on his groundies and his rally ball. He just wasn't giving quarter any opportunity to attack anything, to be honest. And on the grass, especially if you can keep your opponent uh, backed up, uh, it really makes it difficult for them to kind of do anything that makes you feel threatened as the opponent. Um, I think he also used the backhand slice as a approach shot really well, which on other surfaces maybe isn't, the best, but on grass can be really effective. Um, and so, yeah, kept kept quarter deep behind the baseline, used the drop shot well, and then also used the winter's advantage in that match. Lobbed quarter several times, and uh, you could see quarter's frustration. He was just getting annoyed. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we've so we've seen the backhand slice come to play with a lot of people who might have kind of worse backhands when they hit over. We saw it with Berrettini this week mm -hmm. as well, and. Um, yeah, I, I mean, Demonor playing so well. He has so many options. He grew up playing on the surface. He's so fast. He changes directions amazingly well on grass when some people can start, you know, start slipping up. It could be a bit slippery. I, I, he's so good at changing directions. And uh, he really has improved in so many ways. I mean, when you watch him, he's standing so close to the baseline. And even when he's coming to net, he's having great success. Um, it, it's it's It was really good stuff. He was also clutch when he needed to be. That was a big thing. Um that's been a big thing for him in general, I think, over the last kind of, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, half a year since about Canada when he started really picking up in his results. Um, he's he's just constantly one of the toughest outs on the tour. It's hard. You rarely see him getting upset. You see him losing to the top guys, and it's because he's so good in the moments that mattered. He saved four out of four break points against Sebastian Corda, and uh, he was figuring stuff out really well. Very few unforced errors. Um, he's, he, he's just gets one more ball back. He just gets one more ball back. Corda couldn't hit through him and, um, yeah, just so consistent and, um, yeah, just so, so, uh, so, so good from, uh, Demon or, um, for Corda, I felt like in the final, the parts where I, which I saw, he, I felt like his serve wasn't good. And I was looking at, I was looking at the serve stats afterwards and, um, he, uh, his serve stats were not very good. He won like 36% of second serve points and he, Against Greek Spore in the semis, he played awesome. He won over 80% of points on serve, uh, on first serve and second serve. So just a few stats. Uh, he was serving much better earlier in the tournament against Demonor, who's so good returning as well. It was just not as good of a serving day for Korda. But those are some of the things I would mention. And uh, yeah, Demonor is somebody to look out for at Wimbledon. And I kind of want to post the question. Uh, do you have kind of three or five, let's say three names that you kind of are especially looking for as dark horses at Wimbledon? that kind of jump out to you and I can start if you don't have them, <laughs> you don't have them ready. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So some of the people that I would mention for myself, Hercotch, 
is somebody that I would mention. Demon or I think could easily make a semifinal, reach a quarterfinal at Roland Garros. I think that maybe a semifinal could be in his grasp because he just plays so such a strong game on uh, on grass. And also Dimitrov, who's uh, served so well. I'd also mention Draper and Berrettini, who did really well. We'll see if he, they can keep up the level for the future tournaments. But the three I'd name are Hercotch, Dimitrov, and Demonor. Dimitrov serving so well, and his first strike is so good. So those are the three I'd name, and I'd really look out for Demonor as a as a contender. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I almost find it hard to justify like uh, Dimitrov and Hercotch is like a dark horse. Uh, Hercotch has been in a semifinal at Wimbledon before, and and Dimitrov, sure. I think, as well. Um, uh, but, but outside you know, top 10 maybe right they, or, outside the big top or i guess or, demon or is top so yeah, yeah. demon or is top 10. yeah i guess i guess it would be hard to call demon or dark horse. yeah and dimitrov is top 10 too right yeah. um Let's, well you know i mean i i think he might be a dark horse outside of you know your classic picks of alcaraz Sinner, uh and Djokovic if Djokovic is going to play this tournament but I do think um, grass lends itself to players who have experience on the surface a lot of the time. And so that's why I think someone like Adimino does well. He's played a lot on the surface. He's also a little bit older. He's 27. So he has a little bit more experience. Similarly with Berrettini, he's played more tournaments on grass before. So it's less of a learning curve. And I think that's why year in year you see more consistent names. I, I remember looking it up last year. Wimbledon has kind of the, lead, the the most number of repeated winners in any of out of any of the slams and a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know uh, grass has a steep learning curve and the younger players because the grass court season is so small often take a little bit longer to get used to that Alcaraz would be the exception last year to that rule so um I I, I think Hercatch and Dimitrov are great picks as well for Wimbledon, again, because they're a little bit older. They've played this tournament and this season several more times before. Um, and that's why I would give them an edge, for example, over, over names like uh, Holgaruna or, um, you, you know, some of the younger big stars like an Artur Feast who just don't have enough experience on this surface, in my opinion, to um, consistently challenge. But, uh, you know... Alex, I, I, I believe he made the final at Queens last year uh, and narrowly lost to Alcaraz. So he, you know, he'll be in the mix for sure. Um, and, and if there's anybody else I could throw in the mix as a dark horse, ooh, um, maybe Draper, because I, I, I do think, um, again, when you have players who are from a home nation at a slam, it always gives you a bit of an edge. The British crowd seriously gets behind um, behind their players. Last year, we had a wild card for a Brit who won, I think, one or two rounds. He plays at Stanford now. Uh, and Draper obviously grew up on the grass courts. He plays the surface so well. He's a lefty, uh, uses the slice out wide super, super well on the grass. And he would pose um, a challenge uh, kind of for anybody um, on the grass. And I think he has a decent draw at Queens as well. So um, he would probably be the name that I would add to the mix that maybe is a little bit outside of those kind of traditional bigger names. Yeah, I, I think it's perfectly fair. I, I mean, I think a guy like Ben Shelton, I think he should do really well on grass in the in the future, but it just like he's so new to it that I think that it might be a little bit tougher. But yeah, I, I think that those are good names to, to add to the mix. And yeah, Berrettini, where he can struggle on the back end so much. I mean, he was looking great this week, so uh, he always yeah. seems to show up for the grass. And um yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see who kind of shows up. And uh, Corda, Corda, who had a good week this week as well. So, um, but yeah, and then uh, kind of moving on to the final of uh, Stuttgart. So Draper beat uh, Berrettini to win his first ATP title, climbs up to career high of number 31 in the world. Uh, really fantastic final from both. Uh, just about mm -hmm. all of the numbers um, really close when you look at the stats. But uh, I mean, you didn't have to look at the stats. It was it was very solid. A lot of winners from both both playing very aggressively, big forehands, big serves. Uh, it really came out, came down to very kind of small, small differences. And um, yeah, I think that they're both dark horses to look out for everything you kind of mentioned about Jack. I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the same things. And, um, but I do think Bertini, I mean, Bertini had chances to put the way the match in two sets. Uh, I really came down to like the end of the second set. It was, uh, there's a moment at five, five, uh, 1540 and Bertini had an easy return that he just kind of missed. 
And uh, then at six all, it, he was two points away from winning at four five. And um, Jack kind of got out of trouble confidently with some big returns, some drop shots as well came in handy for Jack. And um, yeah, I, I think that that kind of turned the match when Berrettini was go- coming on such good momentum. And that was great to see that kind of confidence and gutsy playing from Jack because in finals before he had struggled and he was playing some poor shots and weaker shots in those moments. So that's something I would say for Draper. And um, yeah, the difference is uh, the difference I think was in ha- their back ends. Draper's back and perform much better, especially in the moments where it mattered. So um, all the all good things for Draper. And I think I'm also, I share in being excited about Jack as another young guy coming up. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree. That match had fairly, fairly fine margins. Uh, to me, I thought um, an area of opportunity for Berrettini to improve is really his like backhand return. Um, it's just, it doesn't penetrate, especially on a second serve. Um, he gets himself into a rally ball position. And with a player of his um, attacking mindset, I think it doesn't bode well for him to be kind of looking just to get returns in. And this is where a matchup against a lefty can be tricky, where you just don't really have the opportunity to run around the backhand return and, and hit a big forehand into um you know, into space and and looking to attack early, and he just didn't really get the opportunity to to capitalize on Draper's second serves, and I think that kind of made the difference in the end of, of that match. But um, yeah, very high level from the, from the two of them. I think Berrettini continues to show us that on grass he will always be a threat, and um, you know he, he did the same thing last season. I think he'll he'll be a threat at Wimbledon this year. And as I said, with with Draper also having the home crowd behind him, I would never underestimate the the British public and their ability to sort of carry players through as well. So um, he'll he'll be riding that high. He's also now the new British men's singles number one. That'll be a huge honor for him to have that name at Wimbledon and kind of in his home press. And uh, he'll also be looking forward to um, to the Olympics and stuff like that, which we'll talk about later on in the pod, but opportunities there for him as well. So he'll, he'll be feeling good to finally get this first title under his belt and out of the way, quell some of those questions uh, and criticism that's maybe come his way a little bit this year and um, show that, you know, that there is a real advantage at this point in the season to, to having grown up in a place where you have access to grass courts. Um, it's just it's just an experience thing with this surface. Oh, it absolutely is. And that's why I think it's the big contradiction of tennis, right? The fact that you have the shortest season for the the surface that's really the hardest to improve upon. And which is, I've mentioned it before, but I think it's something that I would definitely want to improve as uh, for to make the season longer so that, you know, players feel like they have more of an ex- a less of an experience kind of uh, gap when they play the top players that have been around a while, like a like a Djokovic or like a Serena from the last generation per se, right. um, so that they feel like they have a better chance. And because it is such a when you're when you're playing on it, it feels like an impossible surface to overcome and so unpredictable. Um, so I just feel like that, that's why we see everybody playing Queens and Halleck because this is there's no grass masters. You just have to play this week if you want to have any kind of competitive match play in. So, um, yeah. yeah, and that, I mean, uh, we're, we're going to get to Halle, Halle and, um, uh, and Queens later in the, uh, later in the podcast, but yeah, ever that those two tournaments are stacked, very stacked. Um, and then, uh, moving on to the WTA, uh, in Nottingham, we've had Katie Bolter defeating, uh, Pliskova. It was four, six, six, three, six, two. If you want to talk a little bit about what happened in, uh, Nottingham to, start off yeah i mean they just had a horrific week with rain in nottingham um so yeah. that resulted in katie needing to finish her semi-final match against emma Raducanu, who she was down a set to on sunday morning uh she lost a very very close tie break on saturday the rain came down there was just nothing they could do so finished that match sunday morning and then impressively defended the title against pliskova um I think uh, Pliskova's second serve points won, fell off an absolute cliff after the first set. I don't know what happened. It went from like 55% to like 22%. Um, and, and the double fault started creeping in, did not take care of the serve well at all. And Katie was really able to <clears throat> capitalize on what felt like a lot of unforced errors from the Pliskova racket, just um, not, not serving well that second and third set. Uh, Pliskova is obviously a name that 
also <clears throat> comes around every grass court season is a player that has you know in, in the past had success at Wimbledon um and on, on the grass courts as well so I think uh, Bolta has also had a phenomenal year her second WTA title of the year also defending her first title can be quite difficult to do and uh, she is in the last three years only Jabor has won more grass court matches than Bolta which is also an impressive stat considering Jabor's made the last uh, two finals at Wimbledon so she gets that extra time on court there um, but Bolta, you know, uh, loves loves the grass season like many Brits do. Is going to play all of the tournaments that she can. Again, comes in with a little bit more experience on this surface than others, and will certainly be a name that uh, will have the energy of the crowd at Wimbledon. So, um, yeah, impressive week from from her. kept kept the unforced errors down and and played some really solid tennis. So, it was good. Yeah, continuing off good form <laughs> from this year. Uh, she won title earlier earlier in the year actually both weeks uh demon or and bolter ended up winning <laughs> titles the same week which is kind of a neat neat factoid there is a coincidence i don't know it, it, i mean it pro it's probably it's probably a helping hand for for both um but uh yeah and then uh that's uh that's what happened in uh so it's been going on in nottingham for the wta side um and yeah i, I agree about Pliskova. i mean I, she's been really kind of very up and down and staying around the kind of yeah 25 to 35 40 slot somewhere around there for the last She's 50 year. now is she down to 50 now yeah yeah, yeah. i mean she missed most of the clay court season um on again off again injuries uh yeah just hasn't been able to stay healthy over the last year which is a shame um but uh you know it, it will be a factor when it comes to grass courts is playing again in birmingham so she'll you know she'll fancy herself to do well she always causes problems on the grass but uh certainly has been wavering in the rankings. And then, um, yeah, in Hertog and Bosch, we also had a good uh, WTA tournament there with Samsonova defeating Andrescu in the final, a comeback win. She was down 4-6 in the first set, had to come back in the second set from a breakdown to win 6-3, 7-5. This is Andrescu's second tournament back in something like 10 months. So great for her to win a final, but still hasn't won a WTA title on tour since winning her grand slam at the us open so, so this one will hurt a little bit but it's also indicative of your know, positive signs she had a good run in, in the week defeating osaka in what was a bit of a topsy-turvy match but a great matchup between the two of them and um, but ultimately samsonova uh, you know um has had success on the grass before she defeated alexandrova the title defender in the semis to make it to the final and I thought she just played really smart tennis um didn't didn't panic um Andrescu seemed to pick up a little bit of an injury, something with a thigh strapping. But uh, either way, uh, Samsonova, you know, used the slice backhand well, well in particular, approached the net well and um, served smartly as well. Yeah, um, I mean, she's uh, she's somebody who I really enjoy watching. I love her. She has kind of unique strokes to watch from the back of the court, the way she uh, kind of big back swings. And I, I really enjoy watching her game. And I think she's good to have kind of towards the top. And Andrescu, um she hasn't won a title, but I think that's a good first step, right? Because she's she's still only coming back um, kind of to her best. And she hasn't played even that many matches since kind of the end of end of last year, I believe. I mean, she's only kind of slowly coming back. So uh, it's good for her to get to a uh, final. And uh, I'm excited. I'd, I hope to see Osaka and Andreescu both at their best, especially when we get to the hard courts later in the season. Andreescu performing well on grass, Osaka performing well on clay. I feel like it sets up potentially something interesting, but we'll see if Andreescu can get, go all the way and pick up a title at some point as well, because it would be nice to see her uh, really in the mix, because that's where she should be uh, carrying the trophy at the end of at the end of the tournament as well. All right, and now for the weekly power ranking. So for my ATP side, I've got Alcaraz at number one still off of Roland Garros. I don't think things are really going to change that much after a 250 event in terms of the top of the top of the rankings that much after queens and Halle and especially after wimbledon i think we'll see more change in the power rankings which is again just the people who are doing the best at the moment who i'm most excited about at the moment um but yeah alcaraz didn't play we'll see how he looks in queens it's actually going to be really interesting to see him on grass this year to see um where he is against center who has been doing performing really well consistently at wimbledon and uh now center has an improved serve so it's going to be interesting to see where how Alcaraz can do in defending on grass and he's still i mean this is only going to be his fifth grass tournament at at 
at Queens, so that'll be interesting. But anyway, then I have Sinner, similar things that Alcaraz didn't play this week. I've got Zverev as well, all the same there. Demonor jumps way into number four, which is probably my largest jump to being inside the inside the rankings. Um, but Alex, uh, I mean, he probably should have been inside last week. I just couldn't really find room for him because I really want to shout out Matteo Arnaldi, who seemed to perform really well um, as well. But uh, yeah, Demonor, uh, he's just been so, so good. What I've been saying, he deserves to be world number seven. Um, and he's he's just been performing incredibly well on all of the surfaces. Um, he's getting consistently better depth off of his defense, but he's finding ways to be aggressive as well. He was impressing me with how aggressive his forehand was in the match um, in some key moments as well to break to start the second set. I believe he had a forehand winner, just very decisive, aggressive, and I, I love to see it from Demon Or because uh, it's one thing to have that speed that is just otherworldly, but it's another thing um, to not have to rely on it. Like the fact that you can find winners yourself and find ways to dictate as well yourself is um, is a big thing for Demon Or and something that he's uh, is very good for him at the moment. Then I've got Sitspas at number five and Rublev at number six. Um, Djokovic, uh, Djokovic is still in here at number seven. Um, none of these players playing, uh, playing last week, but, uh, Tits Boss and Rublev will be playing Djokovic. We're still unsure about the injury. Taylor Fritz, I'm have uh, hopes for him on grass. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of things that I'm excited about him for grass, um, for, for a multitude of reasons. Um, and, uh, he's been, I think he's having an underrated season. I think that his game, uh, not just the big serve, but the forehand. And also I think kind of improved, improved backhand, um, and being able to, you know, to survive off the backhand this, this year, I feel like it's been better. So I, I have high hopes for him. Then I have Rude and Dimitrov Casper, just not, not playing at the moment for some reason. Uh, he's the only player not in the top 40 and who's not hosting an injury to not be playing. So hopefully we see him soon. And Grigor. Also have high hopes for him because um, of what I was mentioning earlier. So that's my ATP top 10. Yeah, uh, very similar to mine. I ended up taking out Djokovic because um, he's not playing the at least these next uh, this this tournament. So um, for this week, he's not in my power rankings. We'll see if he ends up playing Wimbledon, if I, if I put him back in or not. Um, and I also took out Rublev to make room for Draper um, because I'm hanging on to Bublik in my 10th spot. Okay. He's defending in Halle. I know Bublik had a Bublik moment last week where he retired mid-match, supposedly, because he just didn't feel like playing anymore. Um, Bublik does Bublik things, but I still think he's dangerous on the grass. Um, he has a tricky draw a little bit in Halle, but uh, still on his day. I fancy him a little bit, and I just don't know where Rublev's head is at at the moment post that uh, French Open episode. Obviously, post the Dubai episode, he had a bit of a slump, so not sure what to expect from him. I pushed up uh, Dimitrov and Berrettini because I'm giving a nod to their experience on the grass. If you look at uh, Zverev's record on the grass, it's not particularly impressive, um, and having researched it a little bit more, I think a lot of that probably has to do with his height and he likes to hit the ball at, at hip height. And that's why he feels the most comfortable. And I think uh, the grass obviously keeps you very low, um, lower than that. And I'm not sure that's his, uh, his forte. Um, and I also think that uh, the grass favors the brave and those who really are going to look to win a match rather than look not to lose a match. And that's why grass is so different than clay, where clay, you know, you can knuckle down on your fitness and just ask the other player really to beat themselves by continuing to just be a factor in rallies right. and in games by getting everything back in grass court tennis. It's so much more difficult to play that way. You have to play with a lot more initiative, a lot more purpose and, and look to be attacking. And especially because his forehand is not, you know, a, a weapon in the way that some of these other, you know, uh, top players are. Um, I moved him down and I might move yeah. him down a little bit more when it comes to Wimbledon itself. Yeah, I, th uh, I think I think 
I think Zverev struggles to finish off points with his forehand, I, and exactly. also he doesn't yeah. he doesn't have the net game I think to clear finish off points as well. So when you're not as good of a finisher, that really hurts on grass. Where well, I like what you're saying, you really need to improvise and find ways to you know finish off quick points. And Zverev just doesn't do that. His matches are drainingly long, and and yeah. and they're, they're just like kind of you know they're a te- they're a test of fitness grass isn't a test of fitness they're a test of the moment and figuring out how to finish off points in the moment he doesn't have that improvisation that create creativity the net play um uh, it's it's just it just doesn't really seem to suit him because he doesn't have that kind of that touch where he can finish off the points as easily i think yeah let's see i mean i think he can finish off on the back end um when he wants to but uh, it's about yeah. it's about adjusting that mentality um and what? let's He's see how he does at Hala. Yeah, yeah, and he's got the sub. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I'm. Let's see how he does in Halle. I might move him yeah. down even further, uh, but still a nod to his positive performance in Paris. Medvedev. Um, I think he's a little bit of a different profile than Zverev because he's he can finish uh, with with the forehand. He can play decently at the net, and Medvedev's just quite good at like weird janky shots and retrieving things in all areas of the court. So I think he's less bothered by the bounce on grass. Let's see. Harkac, uh, similar feelings. He's made a semi at Wimbledon before. He's, he's good on the grass. Big serve. Um, Draper, as I said, wanted to sneak in here, give him a nod uh, for his title. And um, that wraps up my power rankings. <clears throat> yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, Bublik, I just... <laughs> I just don't know what to, to expect from him from one tournament to another. Because on grass, if he's playing at his best... He should be great, but we'll, we'll we'll see. He had a great match against Rublev at Wimbledon last year. If he brings out that level, he'll be tough to beat for anybody. So let's just see. Um, Sviantek, uh is in my number one spot for WTA. She did not play this week. Um, neither did Sablinka, Rabakina, Goff, the uh, the big uh, the big players in my uh, in my WTA top 10 we'll see how uh sablinka Rubakna big hopes for the grass Fiontech. we'll see uh she has big hopes for grass courts always and she did improve last year not just in wimbledon but in bad homburg i believe where she got to a semi-final um so we'll see coco and then uh paulini stays uh because due to the rolling girls final i've got ons in here got big hopes for her on grass katie bolter it's not just this week she's been playing great and she loves grass it, it's really what we were saying with uh, what you were saying eliza with um that people grew up on the surface it, it does help with experience um so a good a big thing for uh for bolter and yeah big hopes for her osaka andreva uh kind of at the bottom of my top 10 and samsonova is at my number 10 spot who uh, was very impressive and did pick up a title. I hope that she can keep her ranking up because she's, um, she's very, uh, she's very impressive. I think she should be good on the surface. So I, I was happy to see her pick up a title. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're very similar in this lineup. I have no movers really until the ninth and 10th spot. We haven't seen a lot of these players in action this week. Um, Understand that Sviantek pulled out of Berlin because it's just been such a hectic and insane past uh, six weeks for her. Um, but I do hope that she registers for Bad Hamburg or um, Eastbourne um, because not having a single warm-up tournament on the grass, in my opinion, is not desirable. She's currently not registered for either of those tournaments. So question marks for me uh where that where that puts her in terms of her preparation but um it is what it is uh for me names like uh Jabor stay where she's at even though she lost to Pliskova this week I still thought she played a reasonably good match and she's just so clever on the clay again Wimbledon crowd loves her uh crowds generally love her but um I think she could uh could be a factor again. Colin stays in there for me because uh, just the power and speed factor. Uh, factor. But Juseva again stays defending Wimbledon champion. Got a win today on the grass. I think she's hard hard to, to beat on this surface. And then Bolter and Samsonova, um, you know, success from them this week. So they earned a, a top spot for me. Yeah, well, I, I'd also mentioned Von Drusova reaching the Roland Garros quarterfinal. I mean, she had made the yeah. final Roland Garros before, but I do think grass is a better surface for her. So 
uh, yeah, we'll see how she does in terms of defending. If, if she doesn't defend, she'll definitely drop off a lot, despite the Roland Garros in the U.S. Open quarterfinals. But, yeah, that'll be interesting to watch. Um, and then going into the upcoming section. So for Halle and for uh, Queens, those are tournaments going on at the moment. There are ATP 500 events, defending champion Bublik, who uh, you're just uh, mentioning, as w- uh, who you're just mentioning, got his first uh, ATP 500 title. Uh, I believe it was his third title, second or third title for Bublik. Um, Sinner is the top seed, though, so Sinner is going to be tough to beat. Sinner and Alcaraz are spearheading the Queens in Halle draws, but they are really stacked um, at Queens. I believe Runa is the seventh seed, which just shows how stacked, like uh, how stacked the quarters are. They're really very. Uh, they're, everyone's playing, pretty much. And he lost today against. Uh, a yes, girl's called right. Maverick in Jordan Thompson. <laughs> and if that name is not familiar to you, give him a Google. He's beaten some big yeah. names on the grass before. I believe he may have even beaten Djokovic or gotten close to beating Djokovic on the grass. Played, he played a good is, match against him at Wimbledon. Okay, yeah. yeah. He he is somebody you do not want to see in your draw when it comes to cross court season. That guy no. is a Maverick. So um, impressive win from, from him. And I love this part of the season. Uh, these 500 tournaments are, as you say, absolutely stacked. No buys. Action from the first round. I mean, Alcaraz plays Sarindolo in his first round match. It's a, it's a tough ask, uh, yeah. especially coming into grass season with most of these top players playing on the surface for the first time this week. They've not played the 250s earlier this week because they've just finished up at the French Open the week prior. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's such a tough uh, momentum and and change for these players uh to to get used to quickly and you know someone like aruna will just be like kicking himself because you want to you know try and get deep into these tournaments because you need some match experience and and boom what round one you're out and there's only one more tournament next week left to go or some exhibition matches for him left to play until uh wimbledon so it's just a tricky part of the season for, for these younger players to adjust and um it should be a really interesting uh, uh, indication as to where these top players are and whether they'll be contenders in a fortnight. Yeah, I I, I fully agree. And um, yeah, I mean, with, with yeah, with the schedule of the Olympics coming up, it's going to be a really. I mean, the people who are focusing on grass and the people, some of the names that we were mentioning earlier, I think that they're going to be like, they're going to think, hey, we're not even thinking about the Olympics. We're here to have a deep run at Wimbledon. So it's going to be really yeah. interesting to see how that kind of how that kind of all happens. Uh, WTA, uh, WTA tournaments going on. We've got Berlin and Birmingham uh, with uh, Kvidva and Ostapenko are the defending champs. Um, as you as you mentioned, Sviantek is out of Berlin. Um, I do hope that she does play a warm-up because I feel like it would be a very good thing for her. That she's, she, I mean, listen, uh, she's not – I don't think she's as comfortable on grass at the moment as, say, a Rabachna or Sabalinka. I mean, she might be the better player at the moment, but she definitely needs some warm-up on the surface, in my opinion, and uh, uh, for sure. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how those tournaments pan out. Berlin was very exciting last year. I believe Kvitova beat Vekic in the final, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. And uh, that those are uh, – you know, it's going to be a really interesting tournament to watch. And uh, Ostapenko uh, on the grass courts trying to defend. Uh, I always feel like she should do well on grass. And um, I, I think it'll be exciting to see her try to defend. Um, well, unfortunately, yeah. the defense is already done because oh, she, she lost today to, to oh, okay. Kocherita. So uh, <laughs> that that's just Ostapenko for you, but also tough draw, tough draw, um, yeah. playing her early. And um, Kritikova is now the top seed. She's the number two seed. Kind of interesting. She had a decent run there last year. But Kritikova, again, a name that's fallen off the cliff this season, dealing with injuries and illness. Um, but, in a, you know, a number of players are going to try and play themselves into form. But I think the the one to watch really is that Berlin tournament. Which of these bigger names is going to kind of put a stamp early on on this grass court season as to kind of where they're at, where they're at with things. And... Um, yeah, I'm, re- I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a, a great indicator as to who's feeling confident on the surface. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is the WTA 500 of the week. And I mean, Krajikova shouldn't even feel that comfortable on grass, even if she was at her best. So, I mean, that 250 in Birmingham is completely just a wide open wide open tournament. Katie Bolter's in there, so she'll be looking to maybe maybe be somebody. Pliskova is also in there as well. 
So that'll be interesting. But yeah, I, I agree. It's that tournament in Berlin that was really exciting last year. I love the grass that they have in Berlin. It was very fun to watch. So I'm excited to watch more of that this year as well. Yeah. And then and moving uh, on to culture section. Uh, yeah. So Olympic Games is going to be held at the same venue as Roland Garros in Paris, not long after Wimbledon wraps up. But just the end of July, first week of August, Olympics kick off. Again, we're asking players to go from clay to grass to clay to hard yeah. uh, in a matter of about seven to eight weeks span. Uh, and and within that, you've got two Grand Slam tournaments and an Olympic Games. Oh, and just another three weeks after that, you've got the US Open. Um, and, and also a part of the season where there's major point hauls available, a lot of Masters 1000 tournaments, just a lot on the line for these players. And you know, Olympic tennis, uh, there's arguments in favor against it, especially, um, you know, given the history of, of Olympic tennis and its involvement in the Olympics for many, many years, being one of the first sports to be added to the Olympic Games. Um, and then it's a kind of adjustment as uh, professional tennis became a thing in the 1970s and 80s and players were getting paid and, um, you know, playing in the Olympics is meant to be an amateur sport. And so there's just been... I guess uh, players place different weights on the Olympics um, uh, throughout its history. Then we have other factors to consider um, that they're not just thinking about their professional career that's paying their bills, but uh, and also you know affecting their rankings. There's also question marks over players who come from Russia and Belarus who will be playing under neutral flags, so that impacts things. But we have a, a large kind of withdrawal list already. Um, so a number of players from that Belarus-Russia category include Sabalenka, Samsonova, Rublev, and Hachanov. Rublev having won uh, an Olympic gold medal with his partner, Pavlyuchenkova, in the mixed doubles. Yeah. Um, he says that uh, he, he needs surgery, something dealing with chronic tonsillitis. So that's part of his reasoning. I think the Russian Federation put out a statement that was like, uh, we want our players to rest. I think part of that is Russia's, you know, F you to, to the IOC in terms of um, their status within the Olympics this year and, and not being able to uh, play for Russia specifically. And then you have um, at, at other players like Jabor, Mertens, Shelton, Radakanu, and Sabalenka used similar reasoning here that this schedule is just too congested in particular with the WTA's quite strict rules about what number of tournaments you have to play per season. A lot of players have identified this as just like, this is just one too many things on the table to be asked to do. And to be honest with you, uh, I'm a fan of Olympic tennis. I think it's a great opportunity to represent your country. I think anytime you get the chance to do so, you should uh, take it up with open arms, but I can understand that when you're a professional athlete, that's pretty much playing 49 weeks of the calendar year and you are in a situation where you could potentially really put yourself in an injury threatening position by playing an extra tournament such as this one, uh, the reasoning starts to make more and more sense. Um, and it would be one thing, I think, if this Olympics was played on hard courts like Tokyo was, then the players can kind of view this as an alternative warm-up tournament to the American hard courts way. Um, but coming back to the clay after such a short grass season and a very long clay season before and then being asked to go from clay to hard, plus we have the whole controversy that we've been having over this last year with ball changes and all of these things that people don't appreciate how physically demanding it is to change surface uh, in, in this way and in this speed. And uh, for many players um, who, who, you know, might be managing an injury at this stage of the season, who might have their uh, hopes set on a title at the, at the US Open or going far on the hard court swing in America, uh, that this is just not, not good timing uh, for them. And I, I think it's a shame to have an Olympic Games without some of the bigger names, but at the same time, uh, it, it gives opportunities to players who, yeah, maybe aren't quite high, uh, as highly ranked or, um, you know, want an opportunity to represent their country. So I think it'll work out in the end. And uh, for me, what I'm most excited about, I would have never watched Olympic doubles, but now I will because Nadal and oh, Alvarez yeah. are teaming up. <laughs> 
Yeah, I I think it's just not feasible for a lot of players, honestly. Um, yeah. I, I think I think the withdrawal list is big already. I think it's going to get even bigger probably after Wimbledon as well. And it's a it's it's a it's a good point you mentioned with if it was on hard courts like it was in Tokyo, I I feel like we would we would have a different situation. But um, the fact that you're asking to go from clay to grass to clay to hard, it's just not feasible yeah. when you think about how that impacts people, uh, players' bodies and how how many weeks that is. Um, what you're saying, and um, also I, I'd like to point out, like uh, Hatchnoff, he reached the uh, he got a silver medal at last year's Olympics, yeah. but he's not deciding to play. And uh, I quite liked him on clay this uh, this year, but I think it does boil down to also um, priorities, right? And uh, yeah. Sabalenka, Jabor. Uh, they like grass more than they like clay and that's their right. Um, and also I, I would say that about Tim Sonova as well. Um, and yeah, and then you have the Russian Belarus issue, which is playing under a flag for a team, um, for a team, you have that political situation going on there with those countries and that it just makes everything really complicated and really awkward for these athletes. And it kind of, it, it, it hugely impacts their decisions. Uh, and, and it just, it, it, it I, I feel like that is, Part of the reason why but there's a multitude of factors and uh yeah it's sad to see this big withdrawal list but it kind of makes sense once you list out all of the reasons in front of us and uh i'm still excited for the olympics and i think that it should be exciting but it definitely is a bummer to see so many players out especially like sablink and jabork and rublev who are just some of the top top players in the game yeah and look i mean both on the women's and men's side you're gonna have the world number one playing Triantec plans to play at the olympics alcaraz yes. Sinna plan to play at the olympics Tsitsipas plans to play three events at the olympics i mean a lot of the olympics <laughs> really has to do with you know what country you're from um you know different countries place a different emphasis on the olympic games i think jabor would be the one that maybe takes this decision a little bit more to heart with you know, Tunisia not really being a country that is on the map for the Olympic Games. She probably would have liked to do her best to win a medal for her country. But, you know, she's been struggling with a knee injury all season. <clears throat> and this is just not going to be a good time for her. She needs to try to get back inside the, you know, solidly inside the top 10 rankings, qualify for WTA finals, can't, can't risk it at this stage of the season. I think for Team GB, it's always huge. They, they've had winners in the past. Radicanu had three surgeries last year. I mean, for her to, to play in Olympics right now when her season's just been so start-stop doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and so then, yeah, and then you've got like wild cards in there like Osaka and Wozniacki who, you know, still make the draws interesting. So, you know, I, I, I think, um, yes, we'll be without some of the big names, but we will still be with some of the big names. I think it'll still be an interesting tournament to watch, still a factor uh, for, for big time tennis fans. And we, you know, get a little bit of extra clay court tennis. But um, yeah, I mean, I do a part of me, you know, well, I think we should prepare ourselves to see that withdrawal list grow as the grass court season comes to a close as uh, players start to map out what hard court tournaments they're going to be competing in um but uh yeah it's just it's just the timing of this olympic summer is just so brutal and um, it happens every four years i mean a lot i know a lot of people argued uh djokovic you know really lost his chance at a calendar slam because of his bid to try and win an olympic title four years ago so it's just such a tough ask to add an extra big tournament in there in in this way in such a congested part of the schedule so maybe something for um the wta and atp to also really start to try to challenge and think about when it comes to their calendar planning every four years if they want uh their tennis to be on display at the olympic games or whether if that's you know not a factor for them but um yeah yeah it's it's just a challenging part of the season Absolutely. It's an awkward landscape right now when you think about tennis and the Olympics, because when we think about tennis, the pinnacle of the sport isn't it's not like swimming or gymnastics where the pinnacle <laughs> of the sport you think you think of the Olympics when you think of tennis and its pinnacle, it's the it's the grand slams, the four grand slams. And um, it uh, it's a good point. I mean, tennis needs to rethink how how much we want to prioritize the Olympics as part of our thing. And it's not just uh, moving the schedule around, but maybe adding points into play or adding more prize money or whatever it is, just more kind of incentive to let to have players play and more incentive for fans to want to kind of 
join into the tennis, but especially when there's so many other sports going on. And because I think tennis yeah. at the Olympics could and should be a great product, but it needs to it needs to have um, the tours really working to make people care about the uh, about the tennis at the Olympics. I still think the storylines are there. Rafa and no- Novak potentially playing at their last Olympics, or at least you would think their last chances at Olympics, particularly for Novak. 100%. I think most people yeah. would say, yeah. So. Um, I think that the storylines are there, uh, but yeah, once again, just kind of a bummer with the with the withdrawal list. But it it is what it is, and um, yeah, the schedule is crazy for the summer. We're gonna have an insane summer, so it is yeah, what it is. we are not we are not uh, lacking tennis viewing opportunities. So from a fan perspective, yeah. you know, I, I don't think it's a big deal. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a question mark whether the ATP and WTA like collaborate on, you know, their initiative around the Olympic Games. But as I said, a lot of it's going to tie to how your home country looks at the Olympics. It's kind of a cultural thing. Um, and, you know, uh, for, for, as you said, for every other sport or for most sports in the Olympics, this is the pinnacle this is their time when we look at sports that have pros like tennis soccer and things like that um it, it just it creates a different atmosphere and environment i think soccer has taken an interesting approach in that you can only have three players on your team who's over the age of 22 i believe so it's mostly an under 21s tournament when it comes to soccer so it gives a chance for young and rising stars maybe that's something to think about for the future that you know countries have to submit younger players who aren't don't have a global stage when it comes to the pro tours things like that to think about but at the end of the day um as you said the storyline is like where it is right now federer has medals nadal has olympic medals Djokovic doesn't he's gonna want to have one (laughs) this last one in the bag so i'm sure uh, he will be motivated to, to play it and certainly for his home country serbia um he'll have some extra motivation as well yeah, yeah, and Nadal versus Novak. Then from Spain, you have Alcaraz, who just won Roland Garros. So we could have Alcaraz versus those two, and those are, have made for fun matchups as well. So it's 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 going to be good. It's going to be good, despite the disappointing kind of early withdrawals. It should be it should be good. Thank you guys for joining in, and definitely keep Tennis 360 on your radar as we move into Wimbledon. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, all that stuff, and we'll see you guys at the next one.